please settle down. I would like to thank you for your hospitality and the punctuality for maintaining for all these three days. Uh, so today we are going to have a session uh, about open data economy perspectives from a regulator by Joseph Joshi Garu, CTO, IFSCA, Government of India. I request doc Dr. C.K. Raju sir to introduce Joseph Joshi Garu. Thank you, Lishmi. <coughs> So Lishmi usually introduces the chief guest today. I requested Lishmi because I happen to work under under okay Joshi, Joseph Joshi for a while. We worked together for an institution which had close to around 300 employees and uh, you know big institution. <coughs> so uh, so I thought it will be it will be nice. It won't be nice on my part to be on that other side when the chief guest is here. And uh, we all know about this uh, UPI application, Beam, and other things, isn't it? Okay. Today, most of the life is centered around uh, this thing. Now, who do you think is the key person behind this, introducing this to India at a scale? Okay. We have this uh, chief guest uh, here. Okay. So this is the man who has been handpicked by the Reserve Bank of India's governor for a specific task, and uh, he is the only person amongst us uh, who. Has, uh, who meets uh, the Prime Minister of India almost at a very regular frequency, like once in once or twice in in a month or two. Okay, that's the that's the kind of uh, portfolios that uh, Joseph Joshi heads uh, uh, for the government of India. Uh, it's a new regulatory authority. So I'll briefly read the profile. Okay, most of this I'm sure will be Greek and Latin to you. Okay. Uh, because and uh, Professor Joseph, uh, so, sorry, Joseph Joshi will, uh, will explain the things to us in a in a little more uh, okay, easy to understand manner. So, <coughs> uh, he's currently the Chief uh, Technology Officer at uh, International Financial Services Centers Authority (IFSCA), which is newly constituted by the Government of India. Okay, for a specific purpose that uh, case, Sri Joseph Joshi will explain. Uh, it's established as a statutory authority by the government of India, and he is a senior technology leader driving fintech, supervisory technology, and other strategic initiatives, including contributing to the fintech agenda at India-UK partnership in, in finance, India-US financial regulatory dialogues, India-Japan macroeconomic policy dialogue. Okay, all these things scares me like anything. Okay, so this is a very truly an international figure, global financial innovation network uh, (GFIN). Inter-regulatory technical group IRTG on fintech under the Financial Stability and Development Council, subcommittee FSDCSC, fintech bridges with overseas regulators amongst others. So truly uh, international portfolio. Prior to this stint, he was part of a management team, uh, senior vice president and vertical head, that co-founded uh, RBI uh, Techn in R Reserve Bank Information Technology (REBIT), the IT subsidiary of Reserve Bank of India, India's uh, Central Bank. Uh, Sri Joseph Joshi has worked on RBI's technology vision with the Information Technology Subcommittee of the Central Board of uh, RBI. He was associated with numerous uh, technology projects and initiatives for the RBI across uh, 25 odd uh, departments. He was member of more than 20 uh, and more uh, technology technical advisory groups, committees, and subcommittees at the Reserve Bank of India. He's an experienced uh, professional with more than uh, 20 years in technology consulting, delivering transformational technology products for government and regulators and Fortune 100 clients with the stints in US, Canada, and Mexico. During his tenure with a Taiwan IT MNC, uh, Infosys, okay, uh, he had managed a portfolio size of more than 100 plus uh, MUSD with a 400 plus uh, team size across uh, different time zones and geographies uh, spread across uh, US, UK. Uh, Latin America, Mexico, Brazil, which includes Le uh, Mexico, Brazil, Argentina, uh, Chile, Costa Rica, El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, and Nicaragua, Philippines, okay, China, and India, okay, the other three. He was also involved in a startup ecosystem and has experience in setting up uh, technology business incubators as his uh, CIO. And I guess as after this meeting gets over. He will be in discussion with uh, Professor uh, Ramesh Loganathan, I guess you all of you know, uh, for uh, 
funding some of the research activities at Triple uh, IT Hyderabad. Okay, so we are indeed uh, blessed by his uh, presence, and we look forward to an, to a, some uh, words of advice and some insights about the work that he has done. Maybe okay, and more. So Joshu Joshi, please stage is yours. Good morning. Okay, not bad for a third day. Definitely a lot of energy. Uh, thanks for the kind words, uh, uh, Professor Raju. Uh, really happy to be in an uh, academic setting. So when he said, I need to sit here, I wanted to sit and experience the other side. Uh, it's really nice. Uh, but then, uh, why a regulator here when you're all technologies, deep tech and data and all the stuff. Uh, I thought probably it will give you a different perspective, uh, especially with Triple IT being an interdisciplinary kind of an you know, encouraging institute, you need to look things from different perspectives. So that's how nature also solves various problems, right? So today you will hear, uh, say, some finance some economics, uh, some technology, and also some regulatory cholesterol, which I might spit once in a while, uh, just to confuse you, <laughs> right? So largely, uh, what I'm going to do is uh, probably I will structure the conversation, or rather I would say this discussion, uh, into three different segments. Uh, one, I will just start with some regulatory aspects, uh, because you need to understand our perspective, the regulatory perspective. So that's why uh, getting to know the regulatory angle is important. Next, I will delve deep into the topic which uh, we are going to explore today, that is your open data economy. And then I will end it up with some uh, emerging areas which the bright minds here can really look into because these are really emerging areas which can solve a lot of problems for not only just the country, but uh, for the whole world. Fair? Fair enough? You with me? Okay. Great. So he introduced a lot of things Yeah, has happened. And right now I am with an institution called uh, IFSCA. How many of you have heard about IFSCA? Please raise your hands. You just heard it now? Not that, before that. <laughs> So very little. So probably I should uh, give some context on that so that you know what perspectives I'm coming from. So before that, let me ask you a question. Uh, are you aware of any financial sector regulators in India other than RBI? Any guesses? You've heard of Reserve Bank of India, of course, because of the currencies we hold. Any other regulators you're aware? I couldn't hear. No? So have you heard of uh, SEBI, Securities Exchange Board of India? Have you ever heard of IRDAI, which is here in Hyderabad? Yeah? Have you heard of uh, PFRDA? So, so these are the four domestic sector regulators we have. OK? Uh, Reserve Bank is for the banking side. SEBI is for the capital markets, IRDI here is for the insurance, as you would already know, and PFRDA, the Pension Funds Regulatory Development Authority, for all the pension funds, your NPS and stuff like that. Okay, so when we had these four regulators, the government created a new one called IFSCA, which I represent now. Uh, so why I'm giving you this history is, like the talent sitting in this room, there was this flight of talent and capital from India to, say, Dubai, Singapore, and other countries, offshore locations. Because there the tax was very less, or there is zero tax, or they had uh, better policies, government rules were kind of uh, very relaxed. So a lot of our talented people and our capital, the talent and capital, took flight from India to all these jurisdictions. 
and one person is nodding his head, probably he's referring to the crypto exodus, <laughs> I do not know. But a lot of things happen like that. So what the government of India thought was, hey, why don't we create this offshore within India? Why should people go out? Correct? So that's where the government started something called as the IFSC, International Financial Service Center. Now this was created in a place called Gift City in Gujarat. How many of you heard of Gift City? Please raise your hands. Again, very few. So this is a place in Gandhinagar, the capital of Gujarat. Gift is Gujarat International Financial Tech City, a fintech kind of a city. And in that, they created a zone called IFSC, International Financial Services Center. So this was the first IFSC in the country. Now why I'm saying this is, it's very significant because this is like a country within a country. It's a foreign jurisdiction there. So you can't do business in Indian rupee. You can only do business in US dollars or in any of the other foreign currency. So it's a foreign jurisdiction. So it's within India, but it's a foreign jurisdiction. So the regulations were initially managed by the four domestic sector regulators whom we spoke. But later on, they felt, OK, we need a unified regulator, a regulator who has the powers of all these four regulators together for the IFSC. And that's why the authority, IFSCA, came into being through an act of the parliament. So just some history here so that you understand the con context of where I'm coming from and what I'm going to talk about. So basically, we are a unified regulator which looks after banking, capital markets, insurance, and pension funds. But we look only within the IFSC. So when you say you're a regulator, Today, if a bank has to set up operation, the RBI gives the license. You are aware of that, right? Or if an exchange has to come up, SEBI does it. Similarly, for insurance and so on and so forth. Like that, within IFSC, if a bank has to be set up, then we as IFSC give the license. For the insurance companies and so on and so forth, the same authorization or approvals is what we give. So this is the regulatory cholesterol I'm putting out to you so that you get the context. So this is important because as a citizen of India, sometimes uh, we find that uh, our education system does not train us enough on finance, income tax, laws, legal, what's happening in the country. And as a citizen, you need to know these are the things there. So that tomorrow when you become an entrepreneur, I think last evening your session was on entrepreneurship, you need to know these are pockets in the country which the government has created to encourage entrepreneurs, innovators like you. So this is actually, this IFSC is a tax-free zone. Like it's zero corporate tax, zero GST, zero stamp duty, zero, it's actually zero on lot of counts so that it actually competes with places like Dubai. That's the beauty of this place. So now with this context, and me getting onto the regulatory part, let me get into the business. So now that you have the context of what it is. So as a regulator, we have what we call as regulated entities, the banks, the markets, the brokers, the insurance companies, the pension funds, all are our regulated entities. Now, what is our primary objective, the regulatory perspective, if you have to see, we look at the financial stability, right? You heard recently heard about Sri Lanka's inflation going through the roof. Many countries, I mean, it's just going through the roof. What happens if it happens in India? Are, it's mind-blowing to even think those kind of situations. So the Reserve Bank is doing a lot of stuff on the monetary policy, trying to put things together so that this doesn't go out of control. So that's where for a regulator of financial stability is very important. We look at systemic risks. What do we mean by systemic risk is I loan some money to her, she loans to him, and like now three entities are there. Now one person at the end of it defaults, cannot repay to her, she cannot repay to me. I have a systemic risk here, an example, so that it's very simplified for you. So when you see in the newspaper systemic risk, this is what it is. Like It's like a domino effect which comes into play in different sectors. right? 
FTX. Have you heard of FTX? You guys are not into crypto? <laughs> okay. So, so that has created some domino effect too. Like a lot of big guys have invested, they have written off their investments, some guys cannot repay. So that's how it is. So as a regulator, we are very, very, very conscious about that. Third perspective is our fiduciary responsibility. Now, now, what's this word fiduciary, you know? So let me simplify it. Uh, it's the trust. So if RBI gives a currency saying this is worth 500 rupees, is that paper really 500 rupees? It doesn't take that much to print that currency. It's not a gold coin. It's not a bronze coin like in past. It's a paper. But there is a trust that if I take and give, the banking system will honor it and I will get 500 rupees. That, that trust the public has, that is very important for a regulator. So, so the, what happens is when somebody says a regulator has given approval for an entity, then it means the regulator has checked whatever is possible so that there is no major fraud. It's not a fly-by-night operator who takes the public's money and runs away. Right? So th that kind of trust. And again, another trust is redressal, consumer redressal. You have a problem with a bank or any financial institution, there is a proper mechanism like an obensman and then it goes to the central bank or to the regulatory authority finally. So how can they get it redressed? Of course, it takes some time, but these are the aspects which we look from a regulatory perspective. So now that I've covered, you know, within that last 10 minutes on this regulator, what is IFSCA, a jurisdiction called IFSC, all these probably some of you are hearing it for the first time. So even if it goes over your head and OHT, overhead transmission, it's okay. We are still good for this talk. But if you got something, great. Okay. So now as a regulator, I need to get data from these regulated entities. Now I'm talking data, probably some eyes lit up, right? Because I need to be running models to see whether there is a systemic risk coming up on the radar. I can't do a reactive stance. I have to be proactive, correct? And you all know how powerful data can be. So we need to collect data from regulated entities. So there is an area called, I'm not sure any of you have heard of this, called RegTech. How many of you have heard of that? Can you raise your hand? Nobody? Okay, so I can say whatever I want on that. <laughs> So RegTech is regulatory technology which the regulated entities use tools which might have AI, ML, NLP, whatever, deep tech, so that they can give data to the regulator because the regulator will keep asking a lot of data. Like this institution might be giving a lot of data to, let's say, uh, when they go for an uh, NAAC or NIRF, any of those things, or to UGC or to AICT, whatever the bodies are, there is a lot of information which is given on a regular basis. For us, it's quarterly basis, sometimes even monthly basis, because it's a financial system. We are the financial sector regulator, so we need to handle it like that. It cannot be kept for a year, you know. So if I say uh, after a year we will talk about what's happening to the inflation, by, by the time our economy would have gone out of control. Correct. So COVID, we had some very challenging situation and decisions were taken very quickly. We cannot wait for a long time, right? So that's where this rec tech comes in and the data which the regulator gives to us can be a lot simplified if they use AI and ML to give the data to the regulator. Now what happens is today, I'm just talking from a banking in industry perspective, just for this compliance part, they are spending 20 to 30 percent of their workforce. So this is clearly an opportunity area where data can be wrangled better, processed better. You know, you could actually bring a lot of value to the business because at the end of the day, people are going to ask you, where is the money, honey? If there is no money, you can't move forward. Right, so that's why the financial sector becomes very, very influential there. And that's why for a bank, 
if I can reduce my compliance cost with your AI ML using this reg tech and give information to the regulator on a regular basis, it's a big win. It's like if I'm spending 100, if 100 rupees is my revenue, if 30 rupees is going for that and that can be knocked off, I make almost 30 rupees profit, which I can do other things, put into R&D, get better products, so on and so forth. So you get an idea of the rectic. You got some idea? Okay. Now there's another side of the column called subtech. This is the supervisory technology. So this is what we as regulators use. Now we got all this data. There are some 200 commercial banks, there are so many NBFCs, 10,500, cooperative banks like that. Just imagine RBI getting all this data from all these 10,000, 15,000 entities. Do you think we can put it into an Excel and process it? It's going to be crazy for us, right? Similarly for every regulator in the world. So that's why they build systems. Again, a lot of your AI ML components go into it to see how can I infer the systemic risks, how can I simulate, how can I do stress test of the economy with the data which is coming in? How can I know when will the next bank default or go under so that I can save the common man the trouble? You know, enough banks have had enough challenges in the past. Or is this NBFC or CHIT company is going to run away because their financial situation is very weak and is it going to impact the common man? So these are kind of things which we can run on the subtech side of things when we get this data. Okay, so just taking a pause here on the regulatory part of it, so you understood the perspectives of what a regulator looks like because we have to take the big picture view. And I also introduced the reg tech and subtech aspect of it. We are good so far? Okay, so nothing very tough, right? Great. So some finance, some economics here and there littered, but simplified or oversimplified for you. Now we actually move to our topic here, right? The open data economy. How many of you have heard about the India stack? Can you please raise your hands? India stack. Oh, I thought I will see more hands for this. Regulatory part, I agree, but India stack is important. Okay, how many of you heard about Aadhaar? Please raise your hands. Okay, fine, good. I am good. <laughs> Great. Uh, so people are awake on the third day. Thank you. Uh, so India today is a sinusure of all eyes globally. People want to know or replicate our Aadhaar. People want to replicate our UPI. People want to see, you know, like, I'm not sure if you read this news when our Honorable External Affairs Minister went to the US along with his son to a restaurant a few months ago, they asked for the vaccination certificate. Mr. Jay Shankar took up his phone, showed his certificate, where his son, who was based in the US, so he was visiting his son there in the US, he was scrambling for a piece of paper, which he got as a certificate. So the most advanced country as a piece of paper given, which you need to carry safely with you for your vaccination status. Whereas India, click off a button or log into Coven app and show it just like that. So that was the difference. And all this is possible because of that concept called of uh, digital public infrastructure or public infrastructure for good, whatever you want to call different ways. And the India stack was a very important component for that. So the India stack, I mean, I'm not going to go deep into it because there is enough content on the web, but just to touch at a high level, the first one came in as a presentless layer, presenseless layer. I don't want uh, you to, be, oh, sorry, I'm, I'm really sorry. The first one was the paperless layer because first we were using a lot of paper because I gave the example of a paper with Mr. Jay Shankar. So how did we make it paperless? We didn't want everybody to carry their ration card or water card and all. Aadhaar came in with your biometric, you could do it. So paperless became presenceless because I can get an OTP now and I need not go in person 
and uh, KYC can be verified. So slowly from paperless we meet to presenceless. So you need not have a paper, you need not even be present in that location. You can validate anywhere from where you are, the OTP based. And then slowly we went to cashless. That's when UPI came in. So thanks to COVID as well, which is the world's largest uh, digital literacy program, even people who never used uh, phone-based apps started using it, right? We just educated a lot of our people, people in villages, uh, especially uh, the, uh, the people who are housewives or your grandmothers, grandfathers, you know, all those people got included, financially included or into that. And largely it was possible because of this India stack. If I don't have the UPI, the convenience, it's not going to be possible, right? And now we have come to the fourth layer of the India stack. Can you guess what that is? It's a tough one. It's a consent-based layer. So what the government has introduced is, hey, now you're talking about data privacy, data protection, all those things coming up. So now it should be consent because a lot of this data is floating around. And it is your and mine data, the individual data. And the way the Googles of the world are using our data to monetize, shouldn't they take our consent? Shouldn't these financial institutions who are taking those data take our consent? Because we are being the product now, even though they're saying it's free. So that's where this consent-based layer is coming up. So probably I will not go into the depth of those because those are all heavy-duty, half-a-day lecture topics. So things which are coming in the consent-based, probably you would have seen in the news, account aggregator. Anybody heard the news, account aggregator? No? ONDC, OKEN, Open Credit Enablement Network, ONDC. All these are emerging things which are kind of going to supercharge this entire open data economy. So while each of it is a half a day session, I will just talk a little bit about account aggregators so that you know the power of what I'm saying. Now what I mean in an account aggregator, so now I have paperless, that is your other is there. Now I have a presenceless where you are having KYC, you not be there, and now I have a cashless, UPI has also come. And now I'm going to say consent based. So take a case of a roadside fruit seller. They want a loan of 10,000 rupees to buy their fruits for the day, sell, make some profit and take money home so that they can feed their family. Now, if they walk into a state bank of India and say, please give me 10,000 rupees loan, what will happen? There will be some 10, 20 different types of documentation they have to give. They have to get signatures and so on and so forth. The time it takes. So that's why most of these people, they go to money lenders. And the rate of interest is crazy. So naturally what happens is the profits they make go down, which means the quality of life of their family is always below poverty or you know below that essential level. They're hand to mouth existence sometimes. Some days there is nothing, no business. It's a bad day for them. Now how do we democratize it? How do we ensure financial inclusion comes in? Right? There are some fintechs. They give loans. I'm not naming them because as a regulator I can't show my affiliation to anybody. I have to be neutral. What they do is they don't want all your big documentations to give the loan. They just need, of course, probably this might not be applicable for a fruit seller, but the model I'm saying with data, how innovative they've become, all they need is your pin code or zip code and your email ID. Using social media analytics, they figure out how good your credit worthiness is. They know that you will repay the loan and they're giving you 10,000. They're willing to take that risk because they have figured out who you are using your activities based on your zip code and email ID. That's it. Can you see how when data becomes open and connected, how the economy opens up? So that's why some of the fintechs in the app itself, your buy now, pay later, you know, all those things can be done just like this. So behind the scenes, there is a powerful AI ML algorithm running, which is doing this check for you. So this account aggregator is exactly that. So if you have given the consent, 
one person at one end can take your data. For example, if I am the lender to professor, I want to know about professor's background, I take his consent and using the account aggregator framework, because he has given the consent, I can go to his bank, I can go to his DMAT account, I can check his insurance policies and get a full financial picture of what the professor has and is doing. And I know, okay, his risk profile is not that crazy and I can definitely lend that loan. So he need not be submitting any documents or running from pillar to post. The loan actually goes to him based on this consent which he has given so that I could as a fintech or one of those service providers can do it. This is just one simple example. So can you see how powerful it becomes when you have a paperless, presenceless, cashless, and a consent-based architecture. That's what India Stack is. So it's important the data hub folks should really know about this because that is creating a revolution. I'm not going into OKEN. OKEN is Open Credit Enablement Network. You might may, may take a no code of it. It's your homework. You can check it out. Similarly, ONDC is making waves. Uh, I won't ex expand ONDC. That's your homework. But all I can tell is what we are trying to do with ONDC is help the small Kirana stores compete with the Amazons and Flipkarts of the world. Now that sounds pretty cool. So check it out on that. So that's how this data is going to help. Now when I say open data, now just take the example of what I gave on professor taking a loan. So now this is all banking information. So it's open banking now. I get a lot of information from the banks. Similarly, if I can get details about his insurance and how insurance companies are talking. I'm calling something called as open insurance now. Based on his investments, I can figure out is he doing more of stock market or fixed deposits or mutual funds. So that becomes open markets or open wealth management. So now it's all getting open where through APIs you're connecting and talking. Very soon you became open finance. So under finance is where I have banking, markets, insurance, pension funds, the way I started or the regulatory thing. So now it becomes open finance. Now we are able to make the connect why I started with that, correct? Now with open finance, I can see all of your financial data. Just imagine if I can plug this into your telecom data. When do you recharge? What plans you use? How much of data you consume? What happens if I can plug this data into the utilities? What kind of electricity consumption? Is it solar or coal based? You know, I can go very dig deep into the data. What happens if I can connect to your healthcare? I know there is some health tech also here. So that's how this open data gets connected across and you get this open data ecosystem where not only your financial information is open finance, you have healthcare, utilities, telecom, Let's say this is a smart building. Even you could talk to the IOTs of this and see how personalized it should get for you as an individual, provided I get the consent. I can do to that level. And that's how this entire open data ecosystem comes to life. Okay. Now we say data is the new oil and all the stuff. But only when you exploit like this across the spectrum with the consent based architecture, that cliche becomes, becomes a reality, that data is the new one. So the ability to connect all these things, it's all data everywhere, and you're monetizing or getting you a good financial inclusion, health benefits, like the example I gave with respect to COVID vaccination, so on and so forth. So that's how the entire open data economy works, and that's what we are trying to do. So National Health Mission is working on certain things from a health stand, that will get connected. So as technologists, you all know why it is very important to have the right architecture, the plumbing. So if you get that right, this entire open data economy can be set right. And that's how India is going to take that leap. So it's like this. The whole West was doing telephones, wired telephones. But we just jumped or leapfrogged to wireless with mobile phones. And now we have more mobile subscribers than America and Australia or whatever put together. 
isn't it? So that's how we will leapfrog using this open data economy. Now to the last part of this, some emerging areas, right? So I said uh, we are a unified regulator, so we look into all these aspects of not only RBI looks only into banking, SEBI looks only into the markets, you know, IRDI to insurance. So we look across the board. And some of the problems we have today are across the board. For example, your KYC. What is KYC? Somebody was saying something. KYC, full form. Excellent. Know your customer. So you go to open a bank account, they say, I want documents for your KYC because I am supposed to know who you are. Why? Because the financial regulator, there's another perspective for us. We do not want to have, um, I would say, money laundering. I do not know if you've heard of those terms or finance terrorism because we do not want somebody to come in and deposit money which is from, say, the dark side of the world. So we want to know who the customer is. That's why the KYC document is very important. PAN, other, blah, blah, blah. Okay, you gave KYC for bank account opening. Now we want to open a DMAT to do some stock trading. Again, they ask for your KYC. Now we want to buy some insurance policy. Again, they ask for your KYC. Right? You want to open NPS, pension fund something. Again, they ask for KYC. Why? I can give it once and they can be reused, right? That's the power of your open data economy. You give it once, it gets connected across so that you're done with it once. They know who you are forever unless you change some basic other parameters which will be caught from another perspective. Okay? Now from the emerging perspective, so this unified KYC is a very good use case to try. If I have an open finance, I just need one KYC for the entire financial world, right? And I can have a one identity across even telecom or, you know, healthcare and other stuff. So that's a long shot, you know, before we could reach there. But just think about the power of the data when it is open. Now for emerging areas, uh, what could be an emerging area? More than emerging area, it's a boiling area, I would say. Climate. 20 years back, when you said climate, uh, we will be thinking about scientists and uh, all those uh, environmental people working to save the planet. Today, when you say climate, COP27 recently happened, they're talking about funds. They need finance, sustainable finance. They're talking about central banks and regulators coming in to do pump in money. Because that's how the game is going. And this climate is not specific to one area. Like it's only for, not for banking. It's not just for markets or insurance. It's cut across. So whenever things cut across, that's when this open data economy becomes very powerful. Now I'll tell you another area. As a financial sector regulator, I have created a regulatory framework to enable space ticks. Now you would be wondering, what is Space got to do with a financial sector regulator, correct? It's very simple. The geospatial intelligence I get from the space techs, which when taken by an agri-tech to give a better loan to a farmer or a better crop insurance to the farmer means there is something called as a loan coming in, there is something called as an insurance coming in, which is a financial instrument. So me as a financial regulator, I'm interested in that. And the route goes to the geospatial data coming from space techs. So I need to encourage them to ensure a better loan or an insurance can be given to my marginal section. That's the connect we are making because we have to be really seeing the emerging area. So space economy, the lunar economy, all these are things which you'll hear a lot coming in days to come. Another area which we're looking at, again, this will benefit from the open data economy is called uh, longevity finance. I'll simplify it very, very, very easily for you. 30 years back in Japan, they woke up to a reality that adult diapers sold more than baby diapers. People were aging very fast. Japan has an aged community there 30 years back. In five to seven years, that will happen in US and Europe. 
in 15 to 20 years this is going to happen in india and china where adult diapers will sell more than baby diapers which means we have a larger older population and the younger population is going to come down all of us will be there probably all of you <laughs> right now that's a big problem it's a multi-dimensional problem and we still have time to solve it right so what i'm saying is just think about it what happens to the health insurance for your grandfather who is 75 years old which insurance company is giving there is the financial inclusion you don't have products like that so we have to think on products like that using this data what happens to investment opportunities for them because they're going to give leave longer so they need money to work harder for them so there should be more innovative ones now some of these people who retired they have a lot of ideas and they have a lot of money also some of them but we are not using that the age tech the silver you know entrepreneur as i call it the white hat you know the silver entrepreneurship they can start startups and create jobs with their experience so but is the regulator or the industry ready to give them loans for a 75 year old person saying i have a great idea i need a loan so there are a lot of financial instruments which we need to kind of revolutionize here because of this longevity not just finance health tech that's an area here as well a lot of things are required if you go to japan or even recently when i went to singapore you could see public places everywhere was tuned to people who will be old who need support your entire entrance entire buildings everything has to be re-architected with that in mind you need a lot of health tech related stuff to come to monitor them all the kids are abroad parents are alone here simple situation right so technology can help with space if i can monitor sitting here what's happening in moon and mars why can't I have a command center in the same city where some of these people who need assistance can be monitored? So if you really look at it, the emerging areas are going to depend a lot on this data aspect, which is going to cut across disciplines. That's why what you guys are doing here with this interdisciplinary approach is so, so relevant for all of us. Before ending, I just want to tell a story from Ravayana. Probably some of you might already know about it. But if you don't know, it's a good thing. So Lord Rama was about to attack Lanka. So that's where the situation is. And like any king, Indian king, he wanted to do a yagna. That's the sacrifice and prayers before starting on the war you know they need that vijayi bhava they need to win so before starting the war they get into that prayer stuff so you want to do that but to do a yagna you need a brahmin priest and he looked around and he saw only monkeys the vanara sena was there where is the brahmin priest to do it have you heard of the story anyone no Oh my God, then I can make the story the way I want. <laughs> okay. So then there was no Brahmin. They were in the tip of India, wherever that is. And Lanka is there and they need a priest to conduct this yagna. Only then they want to start the war. And then somebody said, you know what? Ravana is a Brahmin priest and this is a yagna for Lord Shiva. He's a big Shiv Bhakt. Because you know, Ravana half is his father's side is all... You know, the good part, the Brahmin side of it. And he can do it. Now everybody's like, you want to create a prayer for victory in war and the priest you want to invite, the guy whom you're going to fight. Now all the gods sitting up and watching this got excited, the 33 crore gods. <laughs> Aray, this is very interesting. So Rama says, perfect. Let's send the missionary to Lanka. Check with him, because that's the only possibility in this. A missionary goes to the court of Ravana. And all his courtiers and others are boiling in blood. 
how dare this guy come and asks for my own king to conduct the yajna for the victory of rama to defeat my own king and after patiently hearing the missionary ravana says i will come i am shiv bhakt for lord i will do it now everybody is shocked and nobody dares to talk against ravana correct now ravana goes the gods above are watching what the hell is happening here now ravana goes there meets lord rama and then lord rama says okay please tell me what all is required for this puja ravana gives a list of things because he is very well accomplished guy while he could be little shades of gray and black he is very very accomplished i'm not going to those details you already know how accomplished he is in the vedas and all those stuff now he gives the entire list and then finally he says and all this monkey uh, army goes and vanarasinha gets all the stuff and he says there is one more thing required to make this a perfect complete successful puja the king should have his queen beside him now guess what where is the queen now in lanka <laughs> under whose control under ravana's control and this guy is saying you should have the queen because he was playing the role of the perfect brahmin priest giving the exact things now rama lord rama is thinking what to do and then he says back to ravana you are the priest here you have told us what are the things required and now you have found that something is wanting or not there you please give the solution for that now this gets very interesting so all the lords again sitting 33 crore gods are watching are how will ravana now respond ravana knows what's going to come so then he says okay i will get sita here for the yagna the prayer but after the prayer is done you should promise to send her back with me if that's a deal then this is the deal now it gets even more interesting the whole war is to get sita here and sita is going to come here isn't it so ravana gave this and now everybody is looking to lord rama to see what he is going to say he says yeah deal accepted agreed ravana brings sita yagna happens the gods on the top are all stunned what's happening prayer is over and end of it as with every yagna once the sages completed they have to give a blessing now rama and sita go and bow before ravana now all the gods are watching what will ravana bless them with and true to his nature of being a devout shiv bhakt and being he performed the puja perfectly with no limitations or lack in a whatever he blesses rama with vijayi baba and now the story doesn't end rama approaches ravana and says now that this is complete i need to give you my dakshina because you have to pay as a service what do you want now again all the gods are very interested what will ravana ask he can ask everything back isn't it and everybody is eagerly awaiting and ravana says no i don't want anything i did it for the lord but ram lord ram insists no otherwise it won't be complete you are doing it perfectly well so far if you don't take then ravana thinks and says when i die i want to be in your presence or be in vaikuntha and all because you know the background ravana actually is an incarnation of somebody from there and that's why they say when he dies there is a uh, rama around it and takes his soul back and all the story so that's how it ends now why the story here see if you look at it there was some data which was required i need to conduct a thing and who's the guy it was somewhere there in lanka now with the data they took the information out and then they brought the guy who had the knowledge 
So from data it became information and the knowledge. Now based on the knowledge the things happened and you started getting insights. And then the question and answers between them revealed the true wisdom of how wise men can really be. And that, my friends, finally results into impact. So if I have to draw a parallel to what you're doing here, you're wrangling a lot of data. And from the data, get into the information. Information becomes knowledge, as they say. And knowledge gives you the insights to the wisdom. But if it does not make an impact at a country or a global scale, that wisdom goes waste. So I wish all of you the very best to make the impact. Thank you so much. India. Hmm. Okay. One bank which controls the money of all the people. And I got this insight from a, from a book. So if I take a loan from the bank, banks gives me the loan, but I don't use the entire amount. Okay. So let's assume bank gives me 25 lakhs. So I'll use maybe 10,000 or 20,000 and then remaining is there in the bank. And you as a person who has implemented this for uh, Infosys in the Finacle kind of software, uh, the remaining amount is there with the bank which they can use it for to give service a loan from other person, okay? So which means there is an infinite amount of money in the bank, okay? which uh, can be given, which can be recycled and given to others. So why don't we have that kind of system instead, uh, instead of having multiple banks and then all these conditions? Because with a single bank means uh, infinite amount of money. Anybody, uh, there is always, plus, so why are uh, people in this uh, whole country or in the entire world struggling to live just to get that? Why can't we just you know, be a regulator uh, just uh, supervising this? Right. <laughs> it's a very interesting question. Before that, uh, I want you to reflect on one statement which I'm going to make. When you go to the bank to get the loan, the bank asks for a lot of documents, collaterals. Right? If you take a house loan, your house is with the bank till you finish that loan. Correct? If you take a vehicle loan, the vehicle is technically hypothecated to the bank. It's theirs. So they take a lot of collaterals before giving you the loan. But when you go to the bank to put in a fixed deposit, that is your money, you are putting it in the bank to get the interest. So actually you are loaning the money to the bank. Correct? They are taking money from you as fixed deposits and doing the other business as you said, loaning, lending to other people and all. But when you give your money to the bank, is the bank giving you any collateral? Have you thought about that? When I'm taking money from the bank, the bank is asking all the collaterals. But when I'm giving fixed deposits, that is actually I'm giving money to the bank, I'm actually lending it to them because they're paying me an interest. Fixed deposit gets an interest back. Why is the bank not giving me a collateral? Right? That's where the whole system comes in. So that's where I used a very powerful word called fiduciary, trust and all the stuff. So that's the premise on which the system works, right? So that's where there's a lot of decentralized finance and centralized finance kind of dialogue going on. People want to break away from this hegemony of the centralized world, make it on blockchain. I didn't go to the decentralized world of things because I didn't want it to be completely on a finance or crypto kind of a talk. So that's, that's how the basic premise is. Now, why not only one bank? Why do we have so many? The sad story is even with all these so many banks, my financial inclusion is not complete. You know, when Prime Minister, Honorable Prime Minister brought in the Jan Dan Man, that based on this India stack, we created 400 million banking accounts, just like that. That's more than the population of US, right? And still, we are not at 100% financial inclusion. There are still people who do not have a bank account in our country. So it is not a one size fit all. So why do you see commercial banks at one end, foreign private banks at another end, NBFCs, cooperative banks at the lower end, rural RRBs? So it's like, the flavor there, right? 
each india is a country which is so diverse so is the needs of the people thoughts some like gandhi ji said nature has enough for everybody's needs not for the greed so there are some people who are at the other end of the spectrum who game the system so there are there is a you know like there is a saying like bahu janam palavidam kind of thing right many people many types so that's where you trying to create one size fit all is going to be very very dangerous and risky and that is exactly what happened in the socialist and the communist part of it ours is a democracy complete chaos but we are thriving in the chaos communist which has a iron grip you know we have seen socialist how things have disintegrated in the past as well so that's where this one size fit all will not work in fact there was an interesting study which was done where they got a group of people and they gave everybody the same amount of money let's say 5000 dollars and they said every month we'll give you 5000 dollars we'll not do anything but over a period of time there were some guys smart guys who wanted to increase the 5000 to 10000 and they had come up with various things and there were some other people who did crazy things to lose the 5000 and while they all started same within a period of time there were some who were super rich some who became super poor some who became middle class so even though you started the same scratch the kind of people psychology the needs they have the wants the desires all of these makes a very interesting demographic and that's why one entity doing will not work the other part of the thing is infinite amount of money it is not actually infinite amount technically you're right it could be infinite because nobody is controlled earlier we have gold reserves based on which it was then we got dealing dealing that and all but there is a risk now whatever you're seeing the inflation in the west is because they printed a lot of money so it is not going to be good all the while you print a lot of money very soon inflation is going to come and hit which means it's going to be very expensive for people which means people will go out of business will not have jobs you know civil war you know thefts like that it starts and it, so it's a cycle so that's where controlling it very judiciously that's why i used the word financial stability when i started it's a heavily loaded word all of these things will have to be considered in that before we could do so long and short you know the answer is we need variety of banks uh, digital banks are the flavor of the season as well because we want to do the digital inclusion because there's a lot of work to be done there are still people below the poverty line in the country whom we should be considering as well so my question is around uh, uh, like india stack especially regarding the consent aspect of it so typically once uh, like any financial institution takes consent for through some means or the other not only they use it they give it to lot of other their friends or probably they sell this information right is there a way i think you know the privacy protection related aspects are managed and controlled as part of the regulatory bodies right interesting so the hierarchy is like this you have policies right and based on the policies where the regulations and the regulators come in so in this particular case the recent bill which has been tabled on uh, you know privacy and data protection that will be the policy which will drive the regulators with relevant regulations to do that because if you don't have a policy and you don't have a equally powerful enforcement mechanism this is exactly what happens so yes there is a lot of work to be done in that it's a space which we are looking at and uh, you will see the government meti i mean ministry of electronics and it all doing a lot of stuff in the days to come so that is definitely one area uh, another area which we are also focusing is on cyber security because all going digital now everybody is getting conned and a lot of things are happening and uh, a lot of people are going on to blockchain so what we as financial regulators are doing is we have enabled uh, quantum tech companies in our framework so we are giving authorizations and grants to them right startups in that space because we believe quantum will disrupt all of the secure banking which is happening today they might say blockchain is secure but quantum can take it down in no time those who know quantum know that right so as a financial sector regulator 
I'm very concerned about the financial stability. What happens if the core banking, the mobile banking all goes for a toss? Let's say some country, I don't want to name them, they are very leading in uh, quantum and they are very aggressive to us. <laughs> they attack our systems. Your RTGS, NEFT, IMPS and UPI all is down. You can't transact. Your economy will come to its knees. What happens if power goes down? All the, what happened in elsewhere? What have, I could go on and on like that. So cybersecurity, especially the quantum, is also an area which we are focusing, just like privacy and data protection. So all these are emerging, or some of them are already starting to happen, uh, but we have not done enough. So that's why what you said is happening. Right? And even the enforcement part is something we need to strengthen. Like, say, for example, countries like Singapore and all, justice is immediate. So, But we are a pretty large country compared to their population in us. So slowly things are falling in place. Somebody had a question? Yeah. Sir, every year RBI produces a certain amount of money which has to be circulated around India. Nowadays, population is increasing day by day. How does RBI satisfies the needs of money for every person or how does it adjust the economic crisis? Okay, so when you say satisfies the need, RBI, see, there are countries in Europe which give, no, please sit down. There are countries in Europe which kind of gives the, they call it the universal basic income and stuff like that. They give some basic amount to everybody in their population because the population is within limit. But in India, we don't have such things. But RBI has its own uh, currency management system whereby we know the currency chest, how much of currency is there in each of the currency chest, how much of currency is there in circulation. And see, there is a cost for printing, distributing it, even destroying the soil notes. It's not easy. That's where you would have seen uh, RBI talking about CBDC. Have you heard of CBDC? Central Bank Digital Currency. So that's another emerging thing which is coming in, right? and all this UPI and all these digital transactions is actually making it easier on printing the notes and circulation. So RBI has its own mechanisms to check these things. So there is this monetary policy, which they'll say, you can see every two months, the group comes together, they increase the rate, decrease the rate. Actually what they're doing is they're controlling the amount of money coming into the system so that your inflation can be controlled in very simple terms, right? One side they're printing, other side they know how much should be there in circulation. Other side, they're controlling how much should be there. And also they're trying to bring in new channels like your digital part of it, like CBDC and stuff like that. So that, you know, we can have a holistic thing. But within this room, I can tell you cannot have that perfect formula where you'll get it right every time. There will be misses because certainly COVID-like situation comes, nobody knows how it's going to happen. And there will be these black swan things, right? Black swan means you never expected it at all. Example being, I'm sure you'd have read about it. All these chocolate companies, right, toffee making companies, they suddenly experience, are experiencing loss because of this digitization. They never thought UPI will hurt their fortunes. You know why? Whenever I go to a Kirana store and I buy something for 18 rupees and I give them 20 rupees, he gives me two chocolates. Now I'm paying exactly 18 on UPI. So the chocolate sales actually came down. So these kind of things which will happen, and we need to be aware and calibrate. So that's where, you know, being a central bank is not easy. <laughs> There's a lot of things I need to achieve by balancing the poorest of the poor and the richest of the rich. It's a, it's a very subtle balance. And also India's position in the world stage. So it's internal and external as well. So that's, that's what I would say on that. Good morning, sir. So I recently had that one situation like, so my father has taken a life insurance policy from Exit Life Insurance Company. So uh, he has to pay for every six months a uh, 6,000 rupees. So he taken a policy for 10 years, but he want to stop paying that policy. So he want, want to stop that. So in between he stopped, he loses money, some money, for suppose 18,000 he loses, 8,000 he, he written back with 10,000 only, but he completion of, he will pay fully completion of the period, he will get benefit from that. But when you stop in between, why you are losing money, why, why that things will happen? Okay, 
interesting see um, for every business to run there is a cost of operation right like this institution has to run electricity infrastructure staff supporting staff transport so there's a cost of operations so similarly insurance companies everybody has a cost of operation so that's all taken when every policy is sold it's and the cost of servicing the policy there is a risk reward re ratio there what happens if that person has a health issue if you take a health policy what happens if the person dies because if it's a life insurance fund i have to pay out so there is a risk reward they do their own math the actuarials let me not go technically into it but let's assume there is a math which they do and that's how they come so it's very important that's why reading the terms and conditions before you jumping into it is essential because that is their business model and if you look into the terms and conditions it will be very clearly called out that this is what is going to happen if it is not called out then there is every scope of taking it up to the ombudsman to the regulator or the redressal mechanisms which are there but it will invariably be called out this is where i was telling some time back when we study we forgot to learn about the financial literacy where if we should invest how should we invest we forget something about the legal part of the country what is there in the country itself because these are all very essential for us to kind of be a citizen and lead a life as well so that's their business model that's the type of policy to answer your stuff but the only way we can make it better is improve our own financial literacy and take a very conscious call when we do our own wealth allocation buying policies the financial planning and stuff like that that's what i would say for that a very cool pleasant good good morning sir morning. my name is maunika and i am from kite group of institution and at present everything is getting digitalized while i am coming to triple it suddenly a beggar came to me and he is asking me the money but i but the thing is i'm having the 500 notes i don't have any kind of change then i simply said that sorry i don't have money he's showing his scanner and he's saying that no problem you can do the uh, you can pay online payment so everything is getting digitalized and no one is taking the hand cash so what are the security that you want to provide for making online payments so according to you is it good or bad how it impacts the future right good so you highlighted one aspect of financial inclusion right even the beggar is now financially included in our system <laughs> right even there was this uh, famous picture where uh, you know i do not know what they call it they take the cows around and they you know do some thing and they collect money so the cow had the qr code on the forehead you know <laughs> so i saw that picture so again financial inclusion right but you're right uh in fact uh, that was also one of the points i want to tell but i didn't tell when i was telling the lord rama ravana story right there are two sides to the coin the same guy can be a brahmin priest he can also be a another guy whom we all know and that is exactly what is for the digital aspect as well so that's why as i said some time back cyber security is very much on top of our agenda uh and i also talked about uh, quantum tech because we think that is also important so there are a lot of things which are happening because people don't know that otp scams click here you know all these come in like and then some things are very too good to be true you know give x and make it 10x in so little time so a lot of education is happening uh, like rbi kehta hai amitabh bachan comes a lot of people come you get smss a lot of stuff is happening but you know there's this little element of greed also which makes people fall into the trap they say you are on a vacation a trip all you need to do is give me the otp and within matter everything goes so the awareness is very important right while all these uh, uh, means are being taken so there is something called a cert in in the country have you heard of it cert in its expansion is computer emergency response team of india so any cyber attack happens in india this is the team which will come in right and under that we have something called as a fin cert or a cert focused on financial things you're going to have a telecom cert and stuff like that so all these cyber attacks so cyber attacks is multiple levels right as i said one can be at an individual level your bank account is gone one can be at a country level or at an org level it can attack all the systems here 
Suddenly the powers shut down. All your computers are locked, ransomware. They say you pay me so many bitcoins only then I will unlock. So it can be at organization institution level. It can be at a country level. As I said, I can bring down the power of Mumbai. There was a power outage a few years ago and now in Mumbai people suspect it's a cyber attack. It has happened, you know. So, so it's, it's at a very, very, very different scales it can be. I'm not sure if you know when India and China had a standoff, the Galvan and all the stuff in the Northeast, more than the physical war which was happening there, there was a lot of cyber attacks which was happening. Because we know the data centers and the critical systems which got attacked. But we stopped, nothing went through. We were smarter, if you want to say that way. That's why all your systems are still secure. So the cyberspace is getting really hot and uh, that's also another interesting area where young minds can focus. And the warfare is actually going to space. So from space, using the QKD, quantum key distribution, they're kind of doing a lot of stuff in the cybersecurity area. All right, so yeah, a lot of things are happening and it is going to be an area. Like tomorrow when Metaverse comes, how many of you heard of Metaverse? Okay, a lot of people, so that's an area I should have spoken then. When Metaverse comes, this entire security aspect will go to a next level, not like the bank account getting hacked and all. I'll give you a simple example. In the Metaverse, you can be immortal. How I'm saying that? Today there are haptic suits MIT is developing, which will record my emotions when you're ans asking a question. Let's say this question answer session an AI ML algorithm is reading the data points I'm generating, my body language, what kind of answers I've given. If I wear a haptic suit, all of those things can be captured. So they capture an individual. So metaverse means it's your avatar there and you're doing things here, right? So they capture all of that intel about you, that they know exactly how this individual will answer, will move, will talk, will laugh, will sing, whatever it is. Because oh, AI ML is so powerful with the data points. So long after you're dead also, your avatar can still be alive. Your family can talk to the avatar and they will get exactly the way you would be responding to them. It's good in one angle, but it's very scary, right? Even after you're dead, somebody is accessing all your land records, digital bank accounts and doing stuff. It's very scary. So that's where it's going to go to a next level in the metaverse. We'll stop here. <laughs> so questions? No, I know the topic is so interesting. We will never like to stop. So on behalf of uh, all of us here, especially IHUB and uh, IIIT, uh, CIE and uh, INAI, I would like to thank uh, Professor Joseph Joshi. I said Professor because he is a uh, visiting professor in uh, IAM Ahmedabad also. Lecture, takes lectures uh, in most of the prestigious institutions across the country and also across the globe for uh, sparing some time and then enlightening us with uh, some of the latest interventions that RBI and Government of India is doing. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate all your questions. Thank you.